All right, our speaker to, today is Dima Sanapova from the University of Chicago. And Dima, is this your first time speaking uh, in New York? Uh, I think we well, never had you. In New York, I mean, yeah, <laughs> virtually New York. Yeah, I think this is my first time speaking in the. Well, uh, very, in the very glad to have you one way or another, not in the best setting, but. Um, and she will speak about iteration, re reflection, and singular cardinals. Go right ahead. Okay. Thanks, Vika. And I would like to uh, to thank you guys for inviting me. It's a pleasure being in the Big Apple. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, I'm going to be talking about some joint work with um, Alejandro Poveda and Asaf Rina on um, iteration, reflection, and singular cardinals. So let me start by giving kind of some general motivation uh, to of the context of our uh, our results. So we're motivated by the following two questions. So the first one is, what constraints does cardinal arithmetic impose on combinatorial properties? And the second question is, general question is, can we force compactness and non-compactness properties at the same time? So now what is, uh, what do I mean when I say compactness property? Well, that's an instant where if a property holds for all, I should say strictly smaller substructures of a given object, then it holds for the object itself. And it usually follows from large cardinals as we'll see later on in the talk. Now the key compactness property that I will be focusing on is stationary reflection which we all know and love. So just a little bit of crash course of recalling uh, the definitions. Suppose mu is a regular cardinal. We say that a stationary subset T of mu reflects if at some alpha less than mu, no, T intersection alpha is stationary. And we say that the reflection mu uh, denotes the principle that every stationary subset of mu reflects. And now, as mentioned in the earlier slides, compactness properties, like in particular stationary reflection, follows from large cardinals. So, for example, if kappa is measurable, then reflection at kappa holds. And so, I mean, why is that? Just the usual uh, argument suppose kappa is measurable, you do some elementary embedding with critical point kappa, then take any stationary subset of kappa on the J side, that's a stationary subset of J of kappa, and it reflects at kappa. So then you pull it back. Now, if you get a stronger large cardinal hypothesis, so for example, if kappa is mu super compact, then we have reflection at mu intersection cough less than kappa. And the reason we want going to make a side remark. Uh, we need the cofinality of the points to be below kappa because we need them to be below the critical point of the uh, large cardinal embedding we're using. Okay. So large cardinals imply various instances of reflection. On the other hand, uh, what is an anti-reflection example? So if kappa is regular, if you go to the successor of a regular cardinal kappa plus then the set kappa plus intersection cop kappa never reflects. Mm -hmm. I.e. reflection kappa plus fails. Okay. Uh, so from the, the moral of the story here is that since at successors of regulars, we cannot get full reflection. The only candidates for full reflection are at inaccessible cardinals or successors of singulars. Okay, okay so... Uh, okay, so uh, this is a, a recap of the last slide. Uh, it falls from large cardinals, fails at successors of regulars. Now, recall one of the second questions was uh, can we force compactness and incompactness properties at the same time? So, let me uh, introduce our key incompactness property here. Well, it will be the failure of the singular cardinal hypothesis. So, just to recall, what does uh, the singular cardinal hypothesis SCH states? If kappa is singular strong limit, then two to the kappa equals kappa plus. Uh, 
And then we can also, our, uh, the first question of our motivation was the effect of cardinal arithmetic on combinatorial properties. So does getting reflection impose some constraints on singular cardinal arithmetic or vice versa? Okay. And looking at SCH in the context of stationary reflection addresses both of these questions. What, uh, what is the interplay between cardinal arithmetic and combinatorial properties? And also, what is, uh, you know, can we have these two uh, various levels of compactness and incompactness, you know, forced to be together? Okay. Uh, so a little bit, uh, some more facts about uh, SCH. Uh, this will be a review for most, of course, for most people. Um, so it's a, but for if they're students, it's a parallel of the continuum hypothesis of singular cardinals. That's one way to think about it because it says that for singular kappa, two to the kappa is, you know, achieves the smallest possible value. And it holds above strongly compact cardinals. So this is due to Solovey. Now, what about, can we force failure of SCH? Well, we can, yes, but unlike Continuum hypothesis failing to force the failure of SCH, as we all know, one needs large cardinals. And now that the failure, on the other hand, of SCH is an anti compactness property in itself. Uh, why is that? Because it requires to have some singular cardinal kappa with a small power set function below it, but the power set function blows up at kappa. Okay. So the more uh, particular question that uh, is motivating of our results is, can we get the failure of SCH at kappa together with stationary reflection at kappa plus? So remember, we cannot get full reflection at successors of regulars, but uh, there is nothing wrong with trying to get full reflection at successor of a singular kappa. Okay. So now, now let me uh, talk about some history. So as I mentioned here, SCH can be you know, uh, forced to fail. And this was originally due to Magidor. So in, uh, just uh, for a particular context, let me do this history for the smallest singular cardinal kappa B alpha omega. So in the 70s, uh, Magidor showed that starting with a super compact cardinal, one can force the failure of SCH at alpha omega. And how did he do this? He used like a super compact prickly type forcing. We'll get to prickly forcing in a little bit. And then uh, later by works of uh, Gittig, Mitchell, and Woodin, the large half cardinal hypothesis was reduced to a measurable cap of Mitchell order kappa double plus, and this was optimal. Now it's an optimal large cardinal hypothesis. Now, what about stationary reflection at alpha omega plus one? Another classical result of Magidar in the early 80s is that starting now from omega many super compact cardinals, one can force stationary reflection at alpha omega plus one. And uh, for this theorem, for the forcing constriction, he used an iteration of Levy collapses. Uh, of Levy collapses making all the, the omega many super compact cardinals making them into the elephants. Okay. So the question is, well, can we somehow combine both of these results? So now that uh, I'll get back to, uh, to this later in the talk, but the main like, talking points here uh, highlights is that for Magidor's first result, failure of SH at alpha omega, you know, he was using a, a super compact prickly type forcing. Well, for uh, his and yes, for his result for the stationary reflection at alpha omega plus one, and the construction is completely different. Just Levy collapses of uh, the supercompacts, cardinals between the supercompacts to turn them into the elephants. And just uh, one quick note: so it's uh, it's a nice exercise that in Magidor's construction, of course, SCH will hold at alpha omega in his second construction in this one. All right, and so this uh, brings me to the question, well, can we get both of these guys together? Are there any like, questions before I, so this is kind of where most of like the background stuff for now ends, then I'll 
go back to talk about pre-precursing a bit. All right. Okay, so uh, the answer is yes. Then we have uh, our first theorem to that effect is the following. Suppose that, um, and all of the theorems, uh, are, these are all joint work with Poveda and uh, Renal. So suppose that uh, we have an increasing sequence uh, of supercompact cardinals, kappa n, where each kappa n is kappa plus supercompact. Here kappa is the limit of the kappa n's. Then we have a forcing extension where SCH fails at kappa and stationary reflection holds at kappa plus. And actually we get something stronger. We get um, a slightly stronger version of stationary reflection, which uh, uh, on the slide is denoted here as reflection kappa plus less than omega, i.e. we get finite simultaneous stationary reflection. So for any finite collection of stationary subsets of kappa plus, they reflect at the same uh, ordinal simultaneously. And uh, quick note that this level of reflection is optical. So it's an old theorem, I'm not sure by who, maybe Solvay, that if uh, kappa is singular of cofinality omega, if you have simultaneous reflection for omega many subsets of kappa plus, then this would imply SCH holding at kappa. Okay. So uh, next, let me uh, try to give kind of the idea of this proof. So what is, um, uh, what is the idea behind our construction? Well, we want to somehow combine, uh, so we're going to be forcing SCH to fail at kappa, which will mean we'll somehow be using uh, Frickry type forcings. Yeah. Oh, before that, uh, let me give some history and remarks about, about this uh, first result. So originally this was partially done in 2007 in the Sapsheron's thesis but there was a gap in the proof. And around the same time that me, Seth, and uh, Alejandro did that independently, Ben Neria, Hayut, and uh, Spencer, Spencer Unger obtained a similar result, uh, but with a, quite a different proof. And I believe their preprint is at least on Spencer's web page. And um, also this is, uh, so, uh, Omer, Yair, and Spencer's result is for a cardinal high up kappa. Okay, so now what is uh, our construction using? Well, we want to analyze, so one of the key points is analyze the reflection properties of pre extensions because we'll be using a pre type forcing to violate SCH. And more specifically, what kind of sets do not reflect? And then, as you might guess, the sets that do not reflect, we want to uh, kill their stationarity, but in a careful enough way to keep the reflecting sets reflecting and not destroy any cardinals we don't want destroyed. So these are like the three points and we will be uh, constructing an iteration and at the very first step of the iteration, we will use something called extender-based forcing originally due to um, Magidar and uh, DT. Okay, so let me just go like addressing the very first point, analyzing reflection properties in pre cre extensions. Okay, so as we all know, pre cre forcing is like D2 to, to, to violate the singular cardinal hypothesis. And uh, for example, as I mentioned earlier, in Magidal's result for getting the failure of SCH at alpha omega, he uses the, something called the supercompact prickly forcing. And now uh, what happens with reflection in prickly extensions? So for example, in Magidal's model above with failure of SCH at alpha omega, it's uh, a nice exercise that stationary reflection will fail. And we'll see that this is usually the case when you just force with a pre type forcing. So just as a warm up, well, let's see what happens in the simplest possible case. Suppose you do just a regular vanilla pre extension. What happens with stationary reflection there? Uh, so this is just a, a slide on pre uh, for uh, just a quick recap. 
uh, it's a uh, it's a porcine that of course uses a normal measure on kappa to add the omega sequence through kappa, and here is the setup. Let kappa be measurable. Let u be a normal measure. The forcing conditions are pairs uh, s comma a, where s is a finite sequence of ordinals in kappa increasing, and a is measure one set. And the ordering is given as follows. So S1, A1 is stronger than S0, A0. If so one, we want S1 to extend S0. The difference is contained in the measure one set A0 and we shrink the measure one sets. Um, so in other words, condition, S contains a partial information of the future generic sequence and A contains an information as to how S uh, can be extended. And uh, so it's uh, in the, uh, a little later when I define uh, like our you know, precreon steroids, as I like to call it, it's uh, still helpful to think about this. Any precre forcing has two parts, you know, a stem that contains some finite partial information and measure one part that tells you how you can extend the stem. And I will be referring to S as the stem. Okay. So what is the generic sequence? Well, uh, taking a generic filter for this posit, you just get the union of all the stems. And this gives a sequence alpha n, n less than omega cofinal in kappa. And moreover, this sequence meets every measure one set on a tail end. So just a little bit of notation, I didn't uh, write the stem here, but I'll call as the stem and the length of a condition P, which will be very important later, is just the size of the stem. So it's a finite natural number. So now suppose we start with, uh, you know, such a measurable kappa. P here is the vanilla precre, what happens in uh, VG? Well, it turns out that uh, kappa plus intersection curve V kappa doesn't reflect. And that shouldn't be too surprising because recall that this also does not reflect in V because at the successor of a regular, the set of curve V kappa points doesn't reflect. Mm -hmm. On the other hand though, so not all news is bad. If we start with the kappa, which is kappa plus super compact in V, then every other stationary subset does reflect in the precre extension. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, mo uh, morally speaking, for part two, the proof that every stationary subset of kappa plus intersection of V less than kappa reflects, again, uses the fact that this guy reflects in uh, V. And here I should say the proof uses that every stationary subset of kappa plus intersection of V kappa reflects in V because kappa is kappa plus super compact. And it's actually instructive to see why how this proof of part two goes. So I'm gonna go over it. So again, let G be generic for the vanilla precre. Let kappa be you know, kappa plus super compact in V. We wanna show that in VG, every stationary subset of points of cofinality less than kappa reflects. Okay. So let's pick such a stationary set. And then for each time S, let's look at the traces of this set. So let's look at T sub S, the set of all points alpha, such that there is a P with uh, uh, a condition P with stem S, forcing that alpha is in T dot. Okay. So now first note that each of these traces, T sub S, they themselves are stationary sets in B. Uh, I mean, they're set in V, sorry. And one can prove that densely often they are stationary. And now we have stationary sets in V. Kappa is kappa plus super compact in V. So we can apply reflection in V. So back in V, kappa super compact. So whenever T sub S is stationary, uh, it reflects. And then the final uh, point of, uh, part of the argument is to somehow pull this reflection property back to your generic extension, this of G. Uh, and this, I mean, it's, it's an exercise uh, to show that if T sub S reflects in V, then T reflects in VG. Uh, but so it's a, uh, 
And uh, although this is a very kind of a basic property you know, about vanilla prickly, it will actually be something that will come in handy you know, later on. Again, though, the problematic, problematic of finality is Kv kappa because those sets will, will not reflect. And actually, in any form of prickly extension that singularizes a regular cardinal kappa, kappa plus intersection Kv kappa will not reflect. I mean, for example, it doesn't even reflect in V, so that carries over. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so yes, and this is true in any prickly that singularizes a regular kappa. But now there are prickly type forcings that don't singular that already start with uh, start with a singular cardinal and directly add many prickly sequences to violate SCH. And uh, this gives another way of violating SCH uh, extender-based forcing, which is what we'll actually be using in our construction. All right, so what is extender-based forcing? Well, we start with a cardinal kappa, which is already singular. So kappa is singular, uh, limit of uh, kappa ends, where each kappa n is a strong cardinal. And we want to add, now, since we want to violate SH of kappa in order to blow up the power set of kappa, we're going to add kappa double plus many, you know, omega pre sequences through this product of the kappa ends. And uh, uh, just, to, I'm not, uh, haven't written that much on the slide, but if you remember just from the vanilla pre slide, to add one omega sequence, we needed one normal measure. So here to add many sequences, we need many normal, me many measures, not always normal. And a so we need a, to start with a system of measures on each kappa and then this system will be the extender. This is why uh, it's called an extender based parsing. So those pre, -pre sequences through the product of the kappa ends are added using uh, extenders on every kappa n. So now what happens with the uh, reflection properties in uh, if you force with this uh, forcing, which I'll be calling EBF. So then in VPN, just uh, a quick note, when I say VP, I mean VG for some generic for P. So then we do have reflection for uh, all sets uh, of uncountable cofinality. Now that we no longer need to worry about Called V kappa because kappa was never regular. And however, there are still some non reflecting stationary sites, a point of, point of countable cofinality. So the next order of business is to analyze which are these non reflecting stationary sets and you know, who are they and how can we kill them, basically. Okay. Uh, so, and uh, it turns out that the properties of these uh, non-reflecting stationary sets are kind of remain the same, not only in extender-based forcing and not only in vanilla prickly type forcing, but in a whole broad category of prickly forcings, which we use uh, in our iteration construction. So the next slide is kind of technical, uh, but bear with me for, for a minute. So we wanna we ended up defining this. Uh, category we called, family we called sigma pre forcings with respect to some non-decreasing sequence of kappa n's. And our um, Asaf and Alejandro and I's um, goal in defining this was to define a forcing like a, that will um, apply to both things like EBF, but also to things like just vanilla pre or super compact pre or gitic Sharon pre -cree. So uh, such a forcing P is called sigma pre forcing if part one and very importantly, if you restrict it to a specific length, we have that the forcing is kappa and directed closed. So this is key in later on proving reflection properties. We also want for each condition P to have a uh, identify a set of weak step extensions of P, which we call W sub P. So this will be an anti-chain and they're instrumental in proving things like the pre lemma for the force. Okay, and um, 
and also for proving that mu, uh, the uh, successor of kappa is preserved. Now, we also want uh, whenever we had q less than or equal to p for some weak step extension, p prime of p, q to be a direct extension of p prime, where uh, direct extension here denoted by less than or equal star means the length is the same. So we want a strong line to hold, a strong version of the mu plus chain condition where mu is the guy who ends up being the successor of kappa uh, in the generic extension. And we had a you know, uh, few more uh, technical properties. Now, the main thing to get out of this definition is that it applies to both pre-reforcings that singular, uh, singularize cardinals and also to pre-reforcings like EBF. And what's really important is this, um, uh, this step one, uh, this uh, part one that when you fix the length, your forcing is kappa and directed close. So why would this be important? I mean, in the end, we want to prove that after forcing with pre-cree or iterating with pre-cree, you have some reflection properties. So how do we get reflection properties? Well, we get them from large cardinals. And how do we make uh, cardinals be indestructibly large? Well, by only by forcing with kappa and directed close forcing. So just to give a little bit of a preview, we want our uh, pre-cree forcing speed to be such that if you start with these guys kappa and to be super compact cardinals, if you restrict your forcing to a specific length, they still remain super compact. Okay. And uh, another uh, kind of important part is this double use of P. So maybe those are the only two things to, things to kind of get out of this slide. Do so we want to identify given a con pre precondition all like a maximal anti-chain of the possible kind of weak step extensions of it. So for example, in vanilla pre reforcing this, if you take some condition P, uh, these uh, guys W of P will be given by all possible finite uh, increasing uh, sequences of ordinals you can add to the stem. Okay, for example, okay. So you mean where you don't restrict the second coordinate or just as minimally as you need to? As right? minimally yeah. as you need to, yeah. Uh, sorry, I have a question too. Um, so the kappa sub n's, you were saying you're thinking of them being super compact. In general, do you need other, like, do you need kappa sub n's to be large in some way? Or can it just be like any regular cardinal or whatever? Uh, so... Uh, in the actual application of being able to define pre reforcing you do need them to have some normal measures on them. But we did not include that in the definition. However, in order to define even a vanilla pre reforcing in a way for it to make sense, you have to have at least a measurable cardinal. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we abstracted this uh, general lemma, which kind of combines what happens in, let's say, vanilla pre reforcings or EBF pre reforcings as follows. If P is this, what we call sigma pre reforcing, then in VP, uh, after uh, forcing with P in the generic <coughs> restriction, reflection holds for all stationary subsets of kappa plus, as long as their cofinality is restricted between omega and kappa. This is to avoid uh, the two examples of the non-reflecting stationary sets we, we saw before. Um, Dima, could I just ask another mm -hmm. question? Yes. So uh, in your example for what the weak uh, step extensions would be in the simplest case, uh, I don't quite see, how do you get them to be a maximal anti-chain? I mean, if you have like uh, sequences, finite sequences, one of which extends the other one, then they wouldn't be incompatible uh, if, or like, how do you, or do you fix the length of, no, I don't know. Oh, yes, I fixed the length. Oh, okay. okay. So that's a typo, sorry. So 
uh, such that okay so we actually define w sub p is all of them but for every n we define weak step extensions of length n w n sub p and that's a maximum anti chain yeah thanks okay Peter. all right yeah yeah mm -hmm. you're right it's a maximum anti chain only when you fix the length okay yeah so for example for length one of the vanilla precrete will be p cap like alpha so there will be kappa many of those w's of one sub p yeah thanks let me actually make myself i'm not fix that Okay. All right. And uh, yes, yeah, so the idea will be in the end of you know, doing an iteration forcing with those sigma pre pre forcings. So, uh, okay, we have uh, that after each one of those sigma pre pre forcings, at least enough reflection holds uh, of those uh, subsets, uh, stationary subsets of kappa plus restricted of those cofinalities. Well, now, since we want to be killing the non stationary sets, let's uh, the non reflecting sets, I should say, let's figure out uh, who they are. And again, recall how reflection was shown back in the simplest case, in the vanilla prickly case. So you pick a name T for a stationary set, then you get those traces T sub S indexed by every time S. And if stationary in V by reflection in V, T sub S reflects, and then you, uh, I mean, it takes an argument, but then you pull it back. And this scheme generalizes to other pre forcings and in particular sigma pre forcings uh, as long as instead of the stem, we ended up fixing, we end up fixing the length of conditions. So again, we want to take our name T dot for a stationary set, but instead of looking at it, its traces corresponding to a given stem, we'll look at its traces corresponding to a given length. So let me be uh, more precise. So again, let P be this sigma pre reforcing. Now, here I am taking an actual increasing sequence kappa n. So we are thinking something like the EBF forcing. And let Pn be P restricted to a given length n. Okay, so this is, a, you know, can be a forcing in its own right. It's what kind of forcing is it? Well, remember this will be a kappa n directed closed forcing from our definition of what sigma pre -cre has to be. So let's pick a stationary subset uh, and a name for it, t dot. And now we can identify the following. Uh, so uh, traces t sub n to be uh, the set of all alphas such that exist P in Pn, such that P forces alpha in T dot. So that in itself, of course, will be a condition that could be evaluated in a, uh, not a condition, but a object that could be evaluated in a generic extension by Pn. So this is a slight abuse of notation, but I'm taking a name for it, T dot of n. And now uh, its interpretation. So here, formally speaking, T dots of N is the set of all pairs alpha P such that P is in Pn and P forces with respect to the full forcing that alpha is in T dot. Does that make sense? Okay, so, but you can think of this as the traces of T in generic extensions of Pn. So each T is in N is in Pn. And now, if it is stationary, it may not be, but if it is stationary, it has to reflect because the very first uh, item of the definition of sigma pre reforcing was that this guy, Pn, is kappa n directed closed. Uh, so if we start with uh, kappa n indestructibly super compact, then uh, when stationary, those Tns will reflect. Okay, oh, this is what I said. We'll have a reflection in VPN by the kappa and directed closed. And if this happens uh, often enough, we can get reflection for T, we can pull it back. So to sum up, uh, what we get is the following lemma. Suppose we have, uh, so this is kind of like the, con uh, the contrapositive. Suppose we have a, P name for a non-reflecting stationary set. 
Well, then it has to be the case that for unbounded Lemani ends in a piece of n, the trace t dot n is non-stationary. So in other words, if uh, whenever we have one of those sigma free extensions, if we have uh, an, if a set is non-reflecting, take its name, if you take its traces for what happens when you fix the length, then those guys for unbounded Lemanian are themselves non-stationary. Okay. And this will help us when uh, we, in the next slide, when we want to force a club through the complement of dot t. It will be imperative for us that the traces are themselves non-stationary. So now on the next slide is killing one not reflecting stationary set. Again, let's pick a, a sigma prick reforcing P and suppose T is a non reflecting stationary subset of kappa plus intersection, uh, conflict and kappa. And uh, so here it's, yes, uh, this is the, the lemma of just killing one non-reflecting stationary set. There is a sigma pre-reforcing A such that A projects to P. A forces that uh, T dot is non-stationary. And okay, uh, the point here is that A itself is sigma pre-reforcing. And also I didn't say this, but uh, uh, so here this is in, uh, Although we're not technically assuming that the kappa answer in strictly super compact, we are assuming that the conclusion of this lemma holds. So in our, so you can think of this cap, the kappa answer in destructively super compact. And then when you have a non-reflecting stationary subset uh, T, one can define this forcing A from um, uh, the, uh, that I'm denoting here. To uh, like uh, two variables from t and t dot, and for the some of the key points, how do we force that t dot is non-stationary? Well, in a way, it's the usual thing. We want to force a club disjoint from it. Sorry, um, and, Dima. Uh, yes. This this non-reflecting stationary subset t comes from the forcing extension by p. Or is that the yes. idea? Or, okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So I should have said here, T dot is a P name for a non-reflecting stationary set. So we're uh, forcing this disjoint club from T and uh, it's uh, integral for the construction that for many ends and boundedly many ends, the trace of T, T sub n is non-stationary in BPN. And uh, so preservation of cardinals follows once we prove that A PT sigma prickly, which is where the bulk of the work goes. Um, okay. So, and next we want to iterate this. Now, maybe now I can actually write uh, just a little bit of what uh, this this posit kind of is. If, uh, or maybe I'll, maybe I'll do it at the end because that will, let, let me make sure I go through the, uh, how we iterate this lemma. Okay. All right. So next we want to iterate this. How many times? So kappa double plus many times in order to uh, kill all the non-reflecting stationary sets. And we're going to do this with support kappa. And uh, we actually ended up proving kind of a general framework of a theorem that, you know, potentially could be used for other applications you know, besides just the failure of SCH with stationary reflection. Dima, and... can I ask you one more thing? Sorry. Okay, <laughs> um, no, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I mean, it's a little abstract because I'm not sure what the what the original P uh, does, but uh, so this uh, probably you want to iterate kappa plus many, kappa double plus many times also in order to get the failure of SCH or, or is yeah. that, yeah, okay. Uh, no, uh, no, no, okay. no. We actually are going to get the failure of SCH at the zero step. I see. So this, so that kind of uh, this extender-based forcing already adds kappa double plus many subsets. Yes. So kappa. the extender-based okay. forcing outright violates SCH by adding kappa double plus many pre-sequences. I see. 
I see. And we want to iterate, you know, basically doing this <laughs> lemma, uh, kappa double plus many times because they're going to be kappa double plus many non-reflecting stationary sets that uh, we want to destroy. I see. Interesting. I wonder if uh, if you would get the failure of SCH also in this different way, just because you iterate kappa double plus many times, like if there's maybe there's another way to do it, where you don't worry about SCH in the individual step, but at the end you get it uh, because you iterate so many times, but who knows? Anyway. Well, probably not though, because you are forcing, uh, I mean, you will get it, but again, for the same reason, because it projects to P, because I mean, you're forcing a, uh, you're adding a subset of kappa plus, right, not of kappa. And actually, oh, I see. You're right. Oh, I see. Right. You're 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 destroying the let, stationarity let me, yeah. up there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, for example, if you just look at this forcing, I don't mind saying this because this actually does come into place when we do the result for alpha omega. Uh, it turns out that this forcing A P T, so it projects to P, but um, if you look at its term forcing with respect to P, that forcing is kappa plus closed. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, so, what is the general framework lemma uh, theorem that we actually ended up proving is that um, suppose we have uh, this kappa n strictly increasing with limit kappa. And uh, suppose that Q is a, some given to a sigma pre forcing with respect to uh, the kappa n's. Suppose also that, we, so Q will be the initial step, the zero step. Suppose also that somebody gives us an operation uh, from P comma Z, where Z is something in H kappa double plus to a, fun, no, a functor to APZ, where this operation takes a sigma pre forcing P and an element Z in H kappa double plus to another sigma pre forcing APZ. Then, uh, there is a one can construct kind of abstractly an iteration uh, p alpha alpha less than kappa double plus such that the first step is that given forcing q each p alpha is sigma pre pre and at successor stages we're using exactly that functor given by you know somebody uh, together with the bookkeeping function alpha goes to z alpha. Mm -hmm. So we needed to develop a machinery just to be able to iterate sigma pre uh, And once we have our theorem, then for our uh, application, we just plug in Q will be the, the initial step, will be the EBF forcing. And then the successor step will be given by uh, this lemma to uh, kill the you know, alpha, in the bookkeeping function on stationary set. So let me, okay, so this is the application getting not SCH together with reflection. So let Q, so this is exactly what I said. So let Q be the EBF forcing. And we need uh, like an appropriately chosen uh, bookkeeping function for all the names. So this is in V, for all the names of non-reflecting stationary sets. Um, and uh, I mean, this could be with repetitions. And at successor stages, uh, if, so we check, if T dot alpha is a P alpha name for a non-reflecting stationary set in kappa plus, then we use uh, this uh, posit A P alpha T dot alpha to destroy the stationary T alpha. And in the final extension, uh, P kappa double plus, we get failure, the failure of SCH at kappa and recession at kappa plus. So the failure of SCH, as uh, uh, we talked briefly uh, just a minute ago, was from the very first, is from the very first step, Q uh, being EBF forcing. Now for uh, reflection of kappa plus, uh, the argument is as follows. So suppose we have um, uh, some non-reflecting stationary set. Well, we want to argue that this non-reflecting stationary set must have been once of the, uh, one of those T dots of alpha that we ended up killing. Moreover, 
we need, uh, so it's crucial that each of those A, P alpha, T alpha is themselves sigma prickly and themselves, uh, you know, maintain the nice reflection properties of the original forcing cube. So just to put it informally, uh, what this iteration scheme gives us is a way to kill the non-reflecting stationary sets without um, uh, messing up the good things we've got going for us, namely without messing up the reflection of the sets of the right cofinality. And, um, and yeah, and this is how we get uh, reflection at uh, capital plus, and actually we get finite simultaneous reflection here. It, it takes a little bit of an argument, but uh, we can, uh, well, we get that. Dima, can I, can I ask, can I ask you to go back a slide for mm -hmm. a second? Um, maybe two slides. So could, actually, I, I'll just ask. Um, yeah. So this, in your iteration, so at successor stages, are you saying that you just do this A forcing on top of what you had before? Yes. Or are you saying that at successor stages, you like you, you, you force with the quotient forcing of what you had before so that altogether the iteration up to that stage is, is this A forcing? Um, well, um, let's see. How did you first? So at successor, okay. So this is. I, uh, I, I guess my, my main question is I don't, I, I think I'm missing something because I don't see why you care that this A forcing projects to the, to the sigma prickly P. Yes, because the way we define it is that at successor stages, know that I'm not, you know, usually when people see iteration, they see a P alpha star Q dot alpha, and they tell you what Q dot alpha is. I'm not telling you what Q dot alpha is. I'm just telling you what P alpha plus one is. So here the definition, so this was in, I think, one of the options you gave me. <laughs> but uh, here at successor stages, we just describe the iteration up to and including. So the full P alpha plus one. So this guy A P alpha dot Z alpha is everything that happened from zero to alpha. I see, okay, and so I guess Q alpha, if I were to write this forcing the more standard way, P alpha star uh, Q dot alpha, Q dot alpha, then will be the quotient forcing of A P alpha Z alpha mod P alpha. I see. Okay, excellent. And this is, of course, why we care that it projects because um, we need it to actually have an iteration. Okay. So. Yeah, this is one of those things where it's somehow easier to define up to everything as opposed to. Uh, and um, maybe if I have time, I'll say a little bit why it's uh, kind of intricate in how that stationary set is uh, um, destroyed. Okay, but all right, we have this and now um, for the next uh, uh, kind of result, we, uh, well, we want to bring all of this thing down to earth. Uh, what is earth for what for us so it's alpha omega so can we get this result for kappa equal alpha omega and uh, uh so this is our uh, next theorem that uh yes we can now recall the two classical results of magidor it was from one was from 77 from large cardinals can get not sch alpha omega and also from 82 from large cardinals, one can get reflection at alpha omega plus one. So yeah, nicely enough, it turns out that, you know, those two uh, classical constructions can be combined. And our uh, the final theorem is that suppose, again, there are infinitely many super compact cardinals then there is a generic extension where SCH fails at alpha omega and stationary reflection holes at alpha omega plus one. So in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about this theorem. So it's in one way, we do want to kind of mimic what we did for the high up cardinals kappa. So we want to do some iteration of length kappa double plus pre -pre -force, sigma pre, pre forcing at every stage, such that at every successor stage, we're killing some non-reflecting stationary sets. 
Now, what is one of the big obstacles right away is that, uh, remember, one of the things we wanted to do when we do our iteration is to make sure we don't mess up the good thing we had, namely not to mess up the existing reflection properties. And a crucial part was the indestructibility of the supercompactness, because the way one proves reflection is by using large cardinals. So we start with the supercompact kappa ends, and to argue that at least in some universe they remain super compact is we use that our sigma prick reinforcing is such that when you restrict to the length, it's kappa and directed cost. Well, this you know, cannot happen here, of course, because we want to interleave collapses to make kappa equal alpha omega. So there is uh, no way any of our prick reinforcings, when even if you restrict the length, will be kappa and directed cost. So what uh, maybe, uh, so let's keep this in mind as I uh, state a little bit about the approach. So we'll start with, uh, again, an EBF type forcing, but now this time it has an interleaf collapses to make kappa equal alpha omega. So we'll be making both SCH fail at kappa and kappa be alpha omega in the first step. And again, then we do want to iterate to kill those non-reflecting stationary sets. And let me say a little bit about what we do at the very first step. So this is this really nice poster that uh, Moti donated to us, uh, Moti Gittig, uh, which is, so it's a long, so just for people who, uh, who are more familiar with this stuff, long extender-based forcing, prick reforcing with interleaf collapses, which is kind of new. I mean, a few years ago that uh, the only extender-based forcing with interleaf collapses used short extenders but Moti figured out a way to use it with long extenders. So this is what we're using. Oh, and um, let me also mention, and we can all do this while getting GCH below, below alpha omega in the, in the final model. So in the end, we get a model where GCH holds below alpha omega, so to the alpha omega is alpha omega plus two, and the reflection holds at alpha omega plus one. Okay, so now let me go to like what were the biggest obstacles to get uh, it four small cardinals from the, uh, what was the big difference here between the, uh, from the situation where kappa was high up. And it's this, what I mentioned earlier, it's no longer the case that PN is kappa and directed closed. Now, how do, okay, so, uh, we can factor, so what's, you know, is uh, the, uh, the thing that will save us in the end is that although each PN is not kappa and directed close, we could factor it into two parts, you know, a small forcing followed by a kappa and directed close forcing. But when we say factor, it's not a uh, factor into two products. We can only factor it into a, like an iteration of a small forcing followed by a forcing which is not even quite closed, but a forcing whose term forcing is closed. And uh, the reason why we cannot factor each PN just into pro, so for example, okay, you know, think of your favorite prick reforcing with interleaf collapses. Let's say something, let's say Magidar forcing with interleaf collapses, or, or even super compact prick reforcing with interleaf collapses. How do we, uh, in the end, show preservation of cardinals and stuff? Each, uh, so you take uh, your forcing, you fix the length, and then you can really factor it into products, right? The smaller part, uh, what happens, collapses up to some pre point, and then the big measure one part. The reason, and here we can actually, we could factor the forcing into products only at the very first step. The reason we cannot factor any of the successor like P alpha, P alpha plus one steps into products is precisely uh, th that uh, comment uh, from earlier that the iteration is by necessity defined, not by defining the, by defining what happened, everything up to alpha. So at successor stage P alpha plus one, let me, 
go back to the computer. All right, where is the text message page? Mm. Yeah, just using an iteration scheme. You know, we kind of specify everything that happened up to uh, so far, plus the new things happening at alpha. And looking at a version of this forcing AP alpha Z alpha with interleaf collapses, uh, we cannot, we can only factor it into a two step iteration, but not into a product. Process. Headaches when we're doing it, but um, what I mean, but it, it could be done. And also, the factoring is into um, you know two step iterations such that the second part is I mean, I wrote here closed forcing, but it's only, only the term forcing is closed, so to speak. And then we need now a lift, so of course, we want to show that. Uh, we can define this like a sigma, uh, like, kind of like a sigma precrit type forcing, but with collapses, so that reflection still holds when we fix the length. And to get uh, reflection still holding there, now we need a lifting argument uh, through this um, uh, quotient, and we need a certain quotient preserve stationary sets in order to get reflection. So it's really this uh, this last bullet point, which was the the most intricate and of course then proving all this is preserved under iterating okay. and uh so i mean this is i only have one more slides with uh some open questions uh but maybe if uh since vika said i can stretch it maybe i can uh unless there are also questions but maybe i can write something uh but let me ask if there are any questions while I'm setting this. Okay, so uh, Gunther or Vika, now do I unshare one device in order to share the other? I guess that's how it is. I can stop your sharing right now and you can then share your other okay. uh, screen. Yeah, just and, a second. And then, I'll, and then I'll go back. Okay, sounds good. Okay, but is it sharing? Oh. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Just I want to give a like a kind of a you know may, uh, maybe a, a feel for 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 this. Uh, how exactly are we killing? Are we adding those uh, those clubs? So we have. So you know, this is the. Okay, so P is our like. Pre forcing and remember for every condition P in P, we have this, and here I'll write it correctly, WNs of P are, and I'm going to write this in English, all weak or weakest uh, N-step extensions, N-step extensions of P, of P and they are an anti-chain. Okay. And here the setup is you have those increasing sequence, just think of them as super compacts, up to kappa and mu is kappa plus. Okay. Uh, and this W N of P, the whole point of it is that it's less than mu. Well, that's one of the points. So, what we want to do is define, so suppose you have some name T dot for a non-reflecting stationary set. Oh, and let me just write some, some key part of this W N sub P is that if Q is less than or equal to P, so if Q is stronger than P, and suppose the length of Q is N plus the length of P, then there exists a unique, condition R in W N sub P such that Q is a direct extension of R. So those W N sub P, I mean, you can think of them, they control all possible N extensions of P. Okay. So, you know, we have some P name for a non-reflecting stationary set. 
Okay, so mass of t forces t dots non reflecting. So we want to define this a p t dot, right? And um, conditions are water conditions. Well, I mean, there are two parts because remember, this will project to p. So conditions are two parts p and then call it s dots, uh, s vector. So s vector, you know, will contain information about eventual club that we want to force to be disjoint from T dot. So what is, so this guy is a plant less than or equal to alpha for some alpha less than mu. And just for simplicity, let me, give, okay. I'm not gonna write out all, all of the stuff, but I'm just gonna tell you what is the definition of one of those SIs. So we have um, that SI, HSI is a function from the weak step extensions of P to bounded subsets of mu, where mu is kappa plus, right? Mu is the guy uh, where T is uh, a stationary non-reflecting subset up. And so, and uh, actually these are going to be names for bounded subsets, but you can think of them bounded subsets. And so the, and it's the usual stuff. So the, they, uh, let me tell you what uh, happens in the end. If, uh, if G is P generic, suppose G is P generic and let's say H is a generic, who is the club? So we have to define the club disjoint from T. Well, is when you take the union of all, you know, S, I, sub so R, where R itself is in G. So in other words, this forcing PS dot, so defines, you can think of it simultaneously as uh, what club will you be forcing uh, depending on uh, uh, who uh, gets into this J forcing. Um, so there, I mean, this is why, you know, you can't really define it as usual P alpha star Q dot sub alpha. You really have to define it simultaneously as to what happened so far. The definition of how you're forcing this club uh, subset disjoint from T, I mean, it's, uh, it cannot be separated from the P. And actually we need not just bounded subsets but names for bounded subsets. And I mentioned something about with at alpha omega, so of course we want to interleave collapses. So just looking at the first steps, suppose interleave collapses in the first forcing P, so that Pn is no longer kappa and directed closed. And, oh, but we also want the reflection properties. To, so let me rewrite it. P, T dot projects to P, right? And, uh, so the thing is that the this projection is that's not closed, but it is. But the term forcing is. Where what is the? And it's closed. I can say exactly how much closed. It's mu closed. And the term. I mean. I don't know if I should say what term forcing is or not. Should I? Maybe not. Okay. And this is why to prove reflection properties, we need a lifting argument in the end. Because we're not even the kappa and directed closed forcing is not, it's not technically, it doesn't embed that that nicely into the full iteration. 
All right, so maybe this is how I'm gonna write, unless somebody has a question. And if not, maybe I can go into the into the slides. So uh, if you have a question that requires the whiteboard, it's what now or never. <laughs> no, I can go back. <laughs> I think uh, people seem to be satisfied. So, okay. um, <laughs> so uh, let me stop sharing on this one and maybe I can go back to the, the slides. Okay. Uh, just some open questions. Interestingly enough, for uh, for alpha omega, the same argument for finite simultaneous reflection didn't quite go through. So it is open whether we can get failure of STH at alpha omega with finite simultaneous reflection at alpha omega plus one. Um, and just something more general. Well, no, what other applications can this iteration machine uh, uh, have? And uh, one thing that I'm thinking of maybe something like the tree property of with reflection at alpha omega plus one, something like that, who knows. And uh, thank you guys for, for listening. And this is, yeah. Well, thank you for the great talk. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Sure. Yeah, thanks. Are there any further questions? I mean, we uh, we interrupted Dima a lot during the talk already, but um, uh, maybe there are any more questions. I guess I have a quick question, and mm -hmm. that is, I think that your results are specific to uh, two to the kappa is kappa double plus two to the alpha omega is alpha omega plus two. So, what are the prospects for uh, larger power sets of the singular? So uh, for the problem there is, a, if you try, I mean, it's not completely hopeless, but if you try to make it more than kappa double plus, then you have uh, more non-reflecting stationary subsets to take care of. So your iteration has to be longer, longer than kappa. So suppose you want to make it kappa triple plus, then your iteration will have to be kappa triple plus length. And one, I actually didn't get a chance to talk about it, but actually one big thing we had to deal with in this iteration is uh, preservation of the chain, con uh, chain condition. And this is, remember how I said earlier, at least for Kappa high up, this was um, no, the partially done by Asaf Sharon, mm -hmm. but where the gap was, what uh, was missing is precisely the carrying, uh, carrying over the chain condition. And you need the chain condition to preserve the cardinals, you know, the successor and double successor of kappa. And you actually need, so here, you need the kappa uh, double plus chain condition. And what we ended up doing is this, even a stronger, like a linked stronger version of the chain condition in order to inductively show it goes through. It's um, not, so the argument we have will not work for longer iteration. So something new has to be, done in order to make sure the chain condition carries through. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm, yeah. But so it's open, but it's not, I mean, maybe, you know, it could happen, but uh, there, a new ingredient would be needed. Mm -hmm. Oh, and also let me mention all of these. So all of these are a sequence of three papers now they're all on my webpage. Okay, great. Uh, any further questions? Yes, I have a question. Okay. Actually, actually it's not a question, it's a historical remark. Uh -huh. May I go on? Of course. Yes, um, it shows how naive we were. Uh, back in the early 60s uh, with uh, Easton's thesis about powers of a regular cardinal, um, people thought that the singular cardinals powers of singular cardinals is just going to be a question of hard work, uh, you know, a little hard work. And it was even Steve Heckler's uh, thesis topic for a while. And I see, <laughs> I'm really, I see how naive we were and see how, how really difficult and uh, deep these problems have, have turned out to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
they, they keep me occupied. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, thanks for that historical remark. It's, yeah, I think that's what I heard that in the beginning of when uh, after Eastern's theorem, people were so amazed with what forcing can do. They thought it can do everything right away. <laughs> yeah, I wonder when was when was Silver's theorem about, uh, uh, you know, the successor, uh, the, the GCH at uh, singular of I, uncountable cofinality. I, I think the publication date may be 75, mm. but I'm not sure when. Right. It's about right. It yeah, was uh, 70, 73, I believe it was yeah. proved. So we, so we talked about it in 74 at the International Congress. Mm -hmm. okay. and, that, and that's the, the result in the galvin Heinel paper? Uh, no, I, I, I think... Uh, no, it was much more complicated when Silver did it. Mm -hmm. No. Also, I might mention that at some point between Easton and Silver, uh, so many people have been trying and failing to extend Easton's results to singular cardinals that Frank Drake actually published a paper summarizing the failures mm -hmm. so that people wouldn't keep rediscovering <laughs> to do this. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, um, uh, thank you again, Dima. Very inspiring talk. I have one last question. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> um, so is this machinery, the Sigma Prickery machinery, um, you seem to have built in that you go to a limit of cofinality omega. Is, is there hope of having sort of longer machinery to, to get results at at singulars of uncountable cofinal. I mean, SCH is not that interesting, I guess, because of mm -hmm. results, but other other things might be. Well, even with SCH, I, I, I think there is. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, it doesn't sound too crazy. I, I think there is hope, yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, you, of course you need, uh, like a modification of the definition of sigma prickery, but it shouldn't be, I mean, because there is a very natural generalization to uncountable cofinality, you know, since the, it's no longer the length, but, but it's, since the stem is always finite. So yeah, I, I think it may be. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. So should I stop sharing this? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Yep, exactly. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I have two quick announcements.